Okay, so now at this time, I would like to introduce our speaker. We are in for a real treat, everyone. Michael Simpson is the leading authority on residential and investment sales for 30 plus years. Thousands of real estate agents, brokers, and investors from around the nation have sought Michael Simpson's training. He is the founder and senior instructor of the National Commercial Real Estate Association, the NCREA, and an internationally recognized expert in commercial real estate sales and leasing. His company, the NCREA, is a national training, consulting, and coaching company responsible for helping thousands transition into the commercial real estate. Michael's curriculum and coaching program have been attributed to producing many multi-million dollar producers in the industry. Michael, thank you so much for joining us again for a second time. We are so looking forward to the fall of this presentation. Over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brittany. And uh, I apologize because I was trying to click in the chat. And every time I did that, it would forward the advanced slides. <laughs> So sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> awesome. Hey, thank you so much. I want to thank Brittany and uh, Bill and uh, everybody in NAR that helped put this together and uh, brought this on. So we, we really appreciate the support there. We've got uh, Stephen Moraldo and Dana Landaveri on with us, our, part of our team. So thank you guys for joining us and helping facilitate this this, after, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at. I want to start with a little story first. Uh, for all of you, and everyone probably has a story about investing or has experience with somebody they know that has a story. And uh, I want to go back to the early 90s. The early 90s was I'd been licensed for just a few years. And I remember I've been through a few shifts now, three or four market shifts in real estate. I'm based here in Long Beach, California. And I remember the first one was uh, the, the riots and the floods and the mudslides and fires. And we just had so much going on in the aerospace industry closing right and left uh, in the, in the early nineties. And I literally was writing an offer on the hood of a car uh, because you couldn't go inside because everything was boarded up and a national guard drives by and I'm writing this offer with this buyer. And I, I kind of, I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen anything like that. And I look at the buyer just kind of like smiling, thinking, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to say about this? And I'm thinking, you know, if you want to get in your car and run and drive away, I'd understand. But, you know, everything was fine. He moved forward with the deal. But I, I bring that up because that was one market shift that I went through in the 90s, and it was scary. And then 2008-ish, roughly, right? Maybe some of you folks on here have been around for these times. And what was that market like in 2008-ish? It was scary, wasn't it? And this market we're in now can be a little scary, although it stayed pretty stable across the United States, especially in the terms of residential real estate. I just want to put that out there because uh, it may not. It may, it may things may get a little more, um, you know, uh, challenging in the in the real estate market, specifically for residential. Uh, we know commercials having some turmoil already, but I want to point out that. Down markets, shifting markets seem so scary at the time. The other thing I want to mention about the, the early 90s is I listed six units on Hollywood Boulevard for $600,000. Six units on Hollywood Boulevard in, in Hollywood, California for $600,000. And at the time, you know, I was newer. So I didn't even, and it certainly was newer to commercial or units, you know, investment property like that. And, and so I was a little nervous about it. I was a little scared. But that, what a deal that was. That property, if you look at that, I had the chance to buy that deal. And I was so worried about my commission and just double ending it and putting the money in the bank. Well, look back at that now. And I look back at that. What's that thing worth? Maybe three and a half, four million dollars. So my question to all of you today is, was that something I should have bought, do you think? And was that a good time to buy? do you think? When the market was tanking, scary, all kinds of things were going on, was that a good time to buy? And I'll let you answer the question, that question because to yourself, because that's what you have to do when we're talking about investing in real estate is you have to think about, is this a good time for me to do this? Is this a good deal? Is this not a good deal? And those, those are the decisions that go through our minds, right? And so uh, I, I like to share that story with you because I look back at it and hands down, absolutely, I should have bought that thing. And absolutely, I wish I would have. And I made some great investments, but I passed on a lot. So 
keep those things in mind when you're trying to, you know, think about a deal and whether you should pick it up. It really is a great time for investing, in my opinion. There really is a great time for getting into commercial real estate, especially if you're out there doing both, like residential and commercial. Brittany said it, the resumercial is my, really my niche and uh, my forte. And I, I believe it's a really great time to do both. Uh, and it's, it's much, much more acceptable now than it has ever been before in our lifetime because of the uh, a couple of things. One, you've got cap rates lower than interest rates. These interest rates are so low. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Interest rates lower than cap rates because these interest rates are so low. So you have the ability to borrow money less than the cap rate of the product that you're purchasing. That's a big, big deal. And I won't have time to really go into that today, but um, we'll talk about cap rates a little bit on this on this call. But I want to mention to you the ability to borrow money less than the cap rate of the of the deal is a huge opportunity that you should try to understand and explain to other investors and understand as well as yourself as being an investor. The other thing that makes the reason that I say it's a great time to do both residential and commercials because look at these residential firms launching commercial divisions. Oh my gosh, OMG. All across the United States, they're, they're launching commercial divisions. Why are they doing that, folks? Wait, wait a minute. Years ago, people would say, hey, you can't do both residential and commercial. You can only do one, right? Maybe you've heard some things like that. Well, guess what, folks? It's much, much more acceptable now because the residential firms are launching commercial divisions. They're doing both. They're, they're, they're both residential and commercial, whether they say it's a division or, you know, separate and you have, you know, whatever. The, 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 the point is, it's a great time to consider getting involved in investment property and specifically commercial and and investments. You know, the future's here, but it's unevenly distributed and it always will be. That's why I kind of chuckle when I see this and hear this. Uh, this kind of came around with um, the COVID, you know, hey, we're all in this together. And I'm thinking, I remember the first time I saw this, I had an NBA basketball player that I watched on on a commercial and he's standing in his, in his gym, his private gym overlooking the ocean with all glass around uh, the, uh, the gym and his pool and his beautiful landscape in the back with the waterfall and his view. And I was thinking, no, dude, we're, we're not in this together at all. You're in a di whole different world than I am right now. I'm stuck in my house and it doesn't look like that. We're not all in this together and we never will be. There's a huge market shift going on, a huge transfer of wealth. Look at these billionaires that are just gobbling up more and more income. Look at the people that are homeless, that are uh, on the other side of that, that are struggling, trying to make ends meet. Maybe they don't have a job, maybe they don't have money for food. We're not all in this together. And there's a huge transfer of wealth. And that's something that always happens, especially in a shifting market and something you should really consider and think about which side of that do you wanna be on? Do you wanna be on the side that is capturing your unfair share of your wealth? Or do you wanna be on the side that's, you know, money's draining your bank account? I think I know the answer to that question. All right, so what we're gonna do today, you've always got a glossary of terms that we like to uh, refer to for doing calculations and formulas and spreadsheets and things like that. We're gonna get into some of this today with you guys um, and you're gonna to wanna to have a calculator and perhaps maybe a blank sheet of a paper and things that you can take notes with. I believe we put the handout in the chat bar, is that correct? So if they didn't get, if they need a copy of this, they have it, is that correct folks? Stephen or Dana? So everything will be made available for members on Friday, October 2nd. So we'll okay. include it in there, yes. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Uh, so we'll get you copies of this so you can have a, a copy of these, of the slide deck as we say. So uh, th that, that, that part there where it has the glossary terms is really handy. It's got the formulas, the calculations that you need to um, remember and, and or refer to for doing calculations. Something to think about. Uh, there's three different types of investors really that are out there. The cash flow investors, the appreciation investors, and the middle of the road investor. And you want to kind of start thinking about which one do you want to be? You know, a lot of times people will say, I'm, I'm looking for something with cash flow. I hear this all the time, looking for something with cash flow. You know, Michael, a good deal that makes sense. It pencils out. Well, I have no idea what that means because it means something different to everybody. You know, if you think about it, if, if I invest, I'll, I'll use California because I'm here in California. Uh, if I invest across the street from Santa Monica Pier, 
I'm investing over here as an appreciation investor. I'm, in, I'm buying things that are, you know, uh, very expensive, very expensive neighborhoods. Why am I doing that? Why am I buying across the street from the ocean? Well, I'm buying that property, those properties there probably for appreciation. Uh, typically those properties go up in value faster in those areas. Tax shelter, trophy properties, ego properties. You know, my uh, friends from college come to town and they say, oh, hey, let me take you down to the pier and, and we'll grab some lunch and uh, I'll show you the properties that I own down there. See, so just ego property, trophy property, um, hopefully goes up in value a little more. And again, uh, tax shelter. Uh, your REIT, your real estate investment trust, your syndicators. If we pool money together and we buy real estate, we're syndicating. We're going to tend to gravitate toward these types of areas because uh, there's not a lot of work involved usually, not a lot of maintenance and management and a high, uh, it's easier to collect rents typically than some of these other areas that we can get into. So those would be some things that we consider when we're, when we're looking for real estate. But if, if I really want cash flow, and I want heavy cash flow, or as much cash flow as I can get, this is not really the area that I should be investing in. I need to get away from the water or the hills or the very expensive neighborhoods and go into some other areas. Now I'm over here in like a cash flow investor type area. And then you have middle of the road. Uh, so what I've got to do today, I just want you to kind of think about what, which one you think you're going to be and what you'd like to be. Obviously, folks, when you have people who say, I, want, I really want cash flow, well, they can't be out here buying in these appreciation neighborhoods necessarily because there's not, you're not going to get a lot of cash flow in those areas typically. You're going to get less cash flow because of the other benefits. Uh, so it helps you to understand and be a reasonable investor if you keep these things in mind. Now, what I've got to do today is teach everybody their, everything there is to, to learn about investing in real estate in 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, what do you guys think? Think I can do that? Probably not, right? The answer is no. The answer is heck no. I'm not even going to try or say that I can. It's not going to happen. What I'm going to suggest you do is if you like this stuff that we're talking about today and uh, jump in some of our other classes, um, come back. Hopefully we'll do another one or two or three of these with NAR. Just keep coming back and keep learning, but don't have this expectation that I'm ready and I've learned everything I need to learn in, in an hour. Don't, that's very, very risky in my opinion. So I've got a lot of things on here that I'm just going to kind of touch on and skim through like what I just did that last slide, but I'm just not going to have a lot of time to really go in depth in some of these uh, conversations that we're having right now, the sake of time. I always have noticed that a lot of investors, I've worked with a ton of investors, and I gotta tell you, I don't know anybody, I have not met any investor yet that has a written real estate investment plan, not one. Not one has a written real estate investment plan outlining, map, mapping out, strategizing their goals and their plans. Uh, although I do have a good friend who uh, lives right around the corner who, who owns a huge company. Uh, in investing, I won't say names and things, but he does. Um, but he's he's top one percent. He's the number one flipper in the United States. Wedgwood, I guess I, it's okay to mention that company. Uh, so most of these folks don't have a written real estate investment plan, and chances are a lot of you don't have a written real estate investment plan, and you just want to start thinking about setting goals and having objectives. And don't just purchase thinking the value is going to go up because you know that's not necessarily always going to happen. So there's goals and objectives that you want to look at. And one of them would be, is it my objective to maximize my return? Is it my objective to live on the cash flow from the property or a combination of the two? Is it my objective to use some of the cash flow for other purposes while at the same time maximizing my return? Depending on the answer would depend on uh, advice that we give or types of properties that we purchase or suggest. And so these are things that you want to consider. So it helps you put together a written real estate investment plan. Another thing that you want to consider are the four ways to determine value. The comparable approach is for residential real estate. Uh, one to four units is the res is residential, <coughs> excuse me, and five and up is commercial. So when we're looking at a house, a rental, two units, three units, four units, triplex, quad, uh, you know, uh, four units, we are using the comparable approach. But we're also going to look at those properties, especially if it's a rental, and think about the income, think about the return on investment, right? Shouldn't we be doing those things? Yeah, think about the cap rates, the GRMs, gross rate multipliers. All of that's really going to apply, uh, even though it's not as important 
but we're certainly going to consider it. So I'm going to spend some time today um, talking a little bit about those things with you guys to help you understand how those things work. The capital asset approach is for a risk of loss. So if I have, now when you took your real estate exam, you learn these things, uh, the four ways to determine value. So hopefully some of this is striking a, a chord with you. Uh, the capital asset approach is for risk of loss. If I have a $2 million property here that I own, I've got money tied up in this property, either in equity or, or uh, you know, financing, that I, and I can't use it to purchase another deal of any kind or an opportunity should it come across. So there's a, uh, there's a uh, way that we consider the risk of loss sometimes, very rarely. The cost approach is for vacant land, okay? Uh, so developers will use this approach and highest and best use, you're familiar with that probably, that, that term. The most common method for determining value in commercial real estate is gonna be the income approach. And we're also gonna really look at it when it's two units, three units, four units, even though that's residential, even a, a house that's a rental property for us or a flip, we should be looking at income and the return on investments that we're getting from those most investors do. So I wanted to, we're gonna hone in on the income approach a lot today, but depending on the property type, uh, you, it could be some of those other methods. So most commonly is the comparable approach or the uh, uh, income approach. We went through this last class. Now I saw something on there about, hey, if I miss the last class, am I gonna be okay? Yeah, you can just go back, because you know we're. Uh, it's not, like Steven said, they build on top of each other, but you won't be lost here because you missed the other class. Uh, we did talk about this slide though, uh, last on our first part one class. And in that class, we went through the, some of these numbers really quickly, but we went through them with you and we explained what they mean and how you do these spreadsheets, how you put them together. And I'm a huge fan, by the way, of spreadsheets, uh, uh, software, uh, uh, all kinds of systems we use, of course, uh, to do these numbers but you gotta understand the basics. It's real important that you understand how this comes together. And then once you get the how and you know how to move these numbers around and what it means when you do that, sure, go ahead and use spreadsheets and, and software and things like that, and you should. So you're not sitting here doing this by hand, but you've gotta understand the basics uh, or you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, it's too risky, right? When we're talking about investing in real estate, it's, it can be very risky, but if your knowledge level is high and you're doing this the right way, uh, you're minimizing risk, and that's what it's all about. Take it, I, I've, I've lost millions, millions of dollars, and I've made millions of dollars. And so uh, you wanna learn from those mistakes, right? And, and learn from those, those losses. So, and try to avoid them <laughs> as much as possible. All right, so here we talked about the vacancy factors, the expense factors, return on investment. Uh, we talked about why we have minimum vacancy factors and expense factors. Uh, at our, in the part one, so I won't go into all that again. The lender uh, requires certain minimums, and we also talked about why they change. So hopefully, for those who were on part one, hopefully you remember, because it's really, really important why a vacancy factor would change or why an expense factor would change. Hopefully you, reason, you remember the two things that caused that to change. Hopefully you remember that. If you don't remember that, guess what? And you were on part one, guess what that means? It means you need to go back and listen to it again and take it again and keep going to class. What I, one of the, I'm a student and what I've always been is a student and what I always suggest is train, training, training. Take more and more and more, especially with these webinars on Zoom like this or the platforms we're using. It's guys, it's really hard to focus. It's hard to pay attention. It's hard not to get distracted. I'm on the other side of this a lot where I'm taking these classes online you know, we're not used to this as, as people. We're used to live group sessions where the instructor sees you, and if he sees you on your phone down here typing, or you're over here doing something else, the you're a little embarrassed by it, so you have a tendency to pay more attention when it's live. On these webinars like this, I, I know people don't. I I'm guilty, I do the same thing. So the only reason I wanna mention that to you is because if you're multitasking or not paying attention to this kind of complicated stuff, of course you're not gonna absorb it, of course not. So what were the two things that caused it to change? The area and the product type. So the area will cause your vacancy and expense factor to change. So I won't go into that in depth, because I did in part one, listen to that recording, 
it, but just understand that's a really, really, really important part because if you mess that up and you get the vacancy and or expense factor wrong and your NOI is incorrect, then everything else is incorrect. The value, the cap rate, everything else is going to be off. The return on investment is off. So it's really important that you understand that. All right, let's say we're looking at a property and uh, we we want to figure out what the value is. Maybe we have a general idea of what it should be, but we want to figure out the value. Now I'm using the income approach right now when I'm having this conversation and I'm using this um, for really five and up because when you're, if it's a, if it's a commercial loan, the lender is going to use this approach. It's called the income approach. Again, if you're using a one to four uh, units, you are most likely going to use a comparable approach but you're also gonna to wanna to look at this stuff to see how it compares with market. So that's how you determine if it's a good deal. So we look at a property and we say, okay, gosh, what's the income from that? And we're gonna take the income, we call it our scheduled gross income. And I believe we have, by the way, we have, I can't see the chat or anything, but we're gonna stop at the end here and, uh, and answer questions at the very end. So we'll stick around um, as long as we're allowed to and answer as many as we can for you guys. Uh, you look at the income of an asset and you annualize everything. We always do these types of spreadsheets and things like this on an annual basis. So you wanna take the monthly income, which is the monthly rent or lease, and multiply it times 12, and boom, get to your annual income. Now, once you've done, that's like the first thing, it's really important, and that is the very first thing that I think we should look at. And then once we're there, now we've got the income, we can kind of start from there. And what we're doing is we're using the vacancy factors that I've that we went through in part one and the expense factors to get to our net operating income. And that's the key. That's the part that we're really looking for now. Now we need to pull comps. And what happens is, so we go, we look at a property, we figure out what the income is and we say, okay, great. I got the income of this, this property. And then we're gonna say, now let's pull comps to determine the value, just like residential real estate. The difference is we're gonna pull the, now I don't have time by the way to talk about where we pull the comps for, uh, commercial and investment properties because the MLS is not always going to be real accurate. There's not going to be much there. So there's tools out there that we, when we, if you jump in one of our other classes or training or maybe down the road and come back to NAR, uh, I can go into all of that with you. Uh, you pull comps and you're looking for three things. So make a note of this. You can see that we highlighted them here. They're cap rate, GRM, and return on investment. Those are the three things we're gonna hone in on, okay? So let's say that we have the, the income of this asset and we know the gross rent multiplier of the comps in the area. And let's say the GRM in the area, the comps are showing 9.9. .9. Well, how do I determine the value quickly if I know my GRM and my gross income? What am I gonna do? I'm going to multiply those together. I'm gonna to take the SGI times the GRM and boom, there's my value. That's a quick and easy way to determine the value. And another reason, by the way, why you wanna refer back to those glossary of terms, because these formulas are all gonna be right there for you and it makes things much easier and faster for you. So we multiply them together to get the value. Okay, now we have the value of the asset, roughly what we think it might sell for or might be worth according to the comps in the neighborhood. But gosh, what's the problem with us using the GRM to determine the value? Why is that a downside, Michael? Well, the downside to that, hopefully there's people out there that know some of these answers are thinking, well, I know the answer to that, Michael. It's because you're using the gross. See, GRM is gross income. It's not taken in consideration vacancy and expenses. The formula for GRM is sales price divided by SGI. That's a formula for GRM, sales price divided by SGI. So the GRM is saying, Michael, I don't care about vacancy. I don't care about expenses. Just give me your gross income and give me your value, your price, and I'm gonna give you my number. Well, shouldn't we care about vacancy and expenses? Yeah, so what, what should we use? What's a truer reflection of value? Well, it's the net operating income, because the, 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 which gives us the cap rate. The cap rate is, comes from the NOI. So the cap rate says, wait a minute, give me the gross income, but back out the vacancy, back out the expenses, give me your net operating income, then give me the price, and I'll give you my number, which is the cap rate. So this is why people, talk about NOI and cap rate so much in commercial real estate. Now, let me back up a minute. 
let's take the NOI, the net operating income. Let's say you, you see a property out there and you want to analyze it using the income approach. You get, you get the gross income. What do I do, Michael? How do I do this? Well, you can take the SGI times the GRM. That's quick and that's easy, but that's not as accurate probably because it's not taking into consideration vacancy and expenses. So, okay, so let's, let's use, let's look at Michael's class one, part one, where he talked about vacancy and expenses. So let me understand why those change and what I should use here. Don't just use what I've got here that you're gonna, you're gonna run into problems doing that. Look at the area, look at the product type and follow the process that I talked about in class one for determining the accurate vacancy factors and expense factors, then get to your net operating income. Okay, now I have my net operating income. I know how to do it correctly. And I've got the correct formulas and calculations. By the way, you guys, we do math classes. We do all kinds of classes. So if you're struggling with any of this and you're going, I'm lost, I'm not getting, I can't see any chat right now at all. Uh, if you are doing that, you know, that's normal. We're used to that, aren't we, Stephen? <laughs> this is our world that we live in. I know it can be challenging. It was challenging for me in the very beginning. So if you're not familiar with this or have not, don't have experience, don't let us lose you. Don't say, oh my gosh, I can't. Do don't do that because we're here to help you, all right? We, we know how to walk you through this stuff the right way and help you learn this correctly and accurately uh, no matter what level you're at. We've been doing this for years. I'm going fast. I'm going super fast right now for a reason. I only have 45 minutes. So I'd rather throw a ton of information at you. So you have to keep coming back and watch it again and listen to it again. I'd rather do that than have two people on here or anybody on here say, oh my gosh, I knew, all, I knew all, most of that. That was kind of boring and slow. I, I don't want to have that happen. I'd rather have people say, oh my gosh, that was a lot of information because then I, we can just say, well, just come back and watch it again. It's free. It's recorded. So uh, bear with us if, if, you're, if we're going fast. Jump into some of our other classes. Uh, we're going to do another webinar right at the end of this, and, and Stephen will put the link in, and we'll talk about that. And you can jump off of this one and jump on the other one, and you can learn about some of our other classes and things that we're doing if you'd like. Uh, so you take the net operating income now. We've calculated the correct way. And now I know the NOI. I pulled comps in the area to get the cap rates in the area. So how do I determine the value, Michael, when I know the NOI and the cap rate? What do I do? Well, you look at your glossary of terms and you see the other way to determine the value is NOI divided by cap. So everybody, if you have a calculator, try it. Take your NOI 96928, plug in your calculator and divide it by 6.37 and, and, and look and see what you get. You can put it in the chat if you'd like. I can't see it, but uh, Stephen can, I think. So you can, yeah, Stephen can. So you can do that and just, or just put it on a piece of paper just to see how it goes, okay? Because that's the formula. NOI divided by cap is the price. You get the price. So I'm curious. I'm dying to see what they're putting in. I can't see it, Stephen, but uh, it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, we got, we got, um, we got one answer. Um, Sandra got it, um, 1.5. Nice. 1.5 yeah, million. She's good. Good job. So when we have more time, when I'm not so rushed, I miss the live stuff. I really do. Uh, but the live stuff, you know, because Stephen and I will do these live and we'll come around behind you. But the live classes, let's face it, it's very difficult. I saw where everyone's from and all these different people on here. And NAR and Brittany does such a great job of getting so many people together from different areas. Well, it'd be very hard for us to do that live. So we can do it virtually like this. In our other classes that we do, we're, it's a little slower. We're letting you practice. You're putting your answers in the chat bar. Stephen and I are looking at them, seeing how many, you know, what you're saying. We're, 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 doing, we're helping you, okay? We're walking you through it. I just don't have time to do that at, this, at that level right now. Okay, so uh, that's how you determine the value. Now, if you're getting something other than a million five, you, you want to remember in, in part one, I talked about, um, about, converting this a cap rate and a G and a return on investment to a percentage. We talked about that in part one because your cap and your return on investment are percentages. So when you're doing the math, it's a percent. So what that means is you've got to take this NOI and convert it. So how do you convert it? You divide it by 0 0.0637. That's the, those are the numbers you put in your calculator. 
96,928 divided by 0 0.0637, okay? And that will give you the correct number uh, if, you, if you did it incorrectly before. And congratulations if you did it correctly. And that's how you determine the value. Now, that is super, super important. And we are here to help you, maybe you know, at the end, certainly, and in our other classes and things, if, you're, if you don't get that, you gotta, you gotta get it, okay? Just understand that, don't freak out, but understand you gotta get that, right? You gotta know how to determine the value. It's, it's, it's everything. So if you don't get that, be sure and ask us at the end of the class or come to, and or come to some of our other stuff. Let's get that down. Uh, all right, so that's, that's, there's two ways to, do, to, do, to determine value. One would be the GRM times the sales price, just to recap that, and that's short and easy, quick, easy. Remember, your investors, your novice investors are going to use GRM. Why? Because we don't really need to know much, right? Just give me the sales price and give me the gross income, and I can figure it out. I can figure out a GRM. Your cap's much more complicated, isn't it? Because the cap rate comes from the NOI, and then it's more math, and it's also vacancy factors and expense factors and when they change. So it's a little more complicated, but it's actually uh, way more accurate because it takes into consideration vacancy and expenses. So your full-time, your experienced, advanced commercial agents or investors, they're only gonna use cap rate. So be careful about speaking to another investor or an agent um, if you are an investor or investing, if you're talking to commercial agents and you're using the GRM, guess what you're doing? They know you're green or, or new. And in a lot of cases, they're not gonna want to you know, work with you because of that. So use that cap rate. I always talk just cap pretty much unless they wanna talk something else like a GRM that I'll use that. Okay, uh, the uh, cap rate. Michael, how do I know if that's a good one? How do I know? That's a question comes up all the time. Or GRM, and then I'll finish this part with the uh, return. How do I know if that's a good one? Well, the answer is what do the comps say? If we are in an area, and a lot of times uh, I'm in a, another state or another area and I don't know, I have no idea what the market is. So I pull the comps and I see what they are. If the comps in the area are giving me cap rates of eight, 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 and eight, well, is this a good deal? No, because it's, it's not eight, right? On the other hand, if the comps in the area are giving us uh, four, 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 and four, and then I see this, is that a good deal? Well, yeah, absolutely it's a good deal. So that's what is going to determine whether I have a good GRM, a good cap rate, or a good return on investment for that matter, is what the market is showing me, just like residential real estate. All right, so uh, hopefully th that's sinking in for you. Now, I, I, I know, again, I'm, I'm not sure what the comments are and things like that, so it doesn't matter because I don't really have time to really slow down and, and explain anyway, but I just, I've been doing this for a long time, and so has Steven, my partner, and we know that this is complicated, and we know that people get confused with this, and we know that people have questions with this, so I, if you're, again, if you're watching this going, wow, I, I'm not sure I'm following this, that's normal, we understand. Uh, and it just takes you coming back, doing exercises and practicing this. The beautiful thing about using the income approach is it's redundant. Once you do it one time, it's just got to come back and do it again and again and again because it doesn't really change. You know, it's the same thing. So the first time it's kind of like, wow, what, what is all this? So, but your opportunities, you guys, your opportunities to make money and to own investment property and to build wealth rely on you sucking it up and, and, and making it work and don't quit. Quitters, you know, quitters are broke. So that's the bottom line. You know, it's, you know, you've got to, you've got to suck it up and fight through it. And that's life. Okay. So uh, if you're struggling a little bit, I, I hope that doesn't push you over the edge. I hope I'm just trying to encourage you uh, in the short time amount of time we've got. Now, return on investment is another indicator that we'll look at um, because it takes into consideration uh, the return that we're getting after debt. So you can see here we have a debt, and that's what I call below the line. The cap rate is all about the value and, the, and how you determine the value. And we use the cap rate based on the NOI, okay? But the cap rate has nothing to do with a loan. Cap rate has nothing to do with debt. 
or money down, nothing. It's just the, it's just the income, isn't it? And the price, the return has to do with debt, loan, money put in. What's my return then on the money I put in? So when we have more time, we can go more in depth than that, but certainly than that, but certainly the return on investment is something that a lot of people obviously are going to look at and you should as well uh, when you're looking at investment properties. So understand glossary of terms, understand how to cal calculate that. And now you understand whether you, this is a good one or not and how you can compare. Uh, second column is, is just current rents. So what you're looking at here, market rents, I mean, the second column, the first column is current rents. So what's my existing income? Whenever I'm looking at something, I'm wondering, is this actually happening right now? Are you giving me, are you showing me actual numbers, Mr. Seller, or Mrs. Seller, or Mr. Durr, or Mrs. Agent, or is this actually happening? Or is this some sort of performa, projection, market? So we call this market rents or projection or performa. And it means that if we raise the rents, as you can see here, this is what these numbers look like. And uh, what you're seeing here is the difference between a million five and a million seven and the value has gone up about 200 and something thousand dollars. And that is because the rents are higher. And this is showing you the importance of raising rents and increasing those rents uh, continuously when you can. I know there's a lot going on with COVID and things like that. So you can't really necessarily do that in everywhere or should you, uh, but it's important to look at that and understand how it has an impact on the value. We have a blank slide there that you can use and refer back to uh, in practice and do exercises with. Now, this is something, you know, more strategies. What, what we do is, is I'm a, I, I am an investment planning specialist is what I am, uh, a commercial real estate investment planning specialist. And, and so because I've got this designation as, as well as Stephen and Dana does, uh, we are commercial real estate investment planning specialists, but we also use these approaches in, resi in residential or investment property all the time because they're so similar, especially when you're using the income approach. And we've got these strategies, these strategies that help people achieve their goals faster. So as an investor, I have, I have goals, right? I have plans and dreams uh, like most of you, all of you hopefully out here. Well, you want to get there as fast as you can, right? And how do you do that? Well, you use written real estate investment planning strategies to get there faster. And we don't have time to go in depth uh, right now, but in our three-day class we do, uh, and this is where I'll go into this in depth, but you can kind of see where I'm going with it right here. We're forcing the value up through forced appreciation. We're increasing the net operating income and not necessarily the market around it. Right, so um, we're increasing the net operating income through operations. Some some investors are better operators than others, and so there's ways to do this: raising rents, increasing occupancy, decreasing expenses, finding other income. What would be other types of what, uh, you know things that are other income? Laundry, parking, cell towers, um, uh, vending machines, late fees, parking fees, rights, mineral rights, oil rights, lake rights, air rights. All kinds of ways to get creative to do this. We just don't have time right now to go into it. But anytime you increase the NOI, you can force the value up without impacting the market, right? Because in some markets, you can't, you know, it is what it is. If it's a 10 cap, and by the way, uh, I want to go back real quick on this. Uh, right here, see where it's 0 0.06.37. So if you take the NOI and you divide it by 0 0.0637, that's how you're getting the value. So, so whatever the cap rate is that you're using from the comps, uh, whether it's a five or four, you would use that. So if it's a 5.05 .05 would be the, how you would do the math. If it's a 7.07, .07. if it's a 15, uh, call Michael right away, okay? <laughs> if there's, I know there's not a lot of 15s out there. Um, I've seen one or two occasionally lately. If there is, reach out. You've got my, uh, I think we have our contact information here. We make sure before we get off that we do. If there's any 15 caps, reach out to me because <laughs> we are going to buy it. All right, but you would, you would use 0.15 would be the math for that and the formula for that. Okay, so let's say if you're in a 10 cap market, and I know there's not a lot of 10 cap markets out there, but let's just say that you are. Uh, for the sake of math, we force the NOI up by, uh, right now the NOI is 100,000. We force the, we, so the formula for determining value that we just went through is 100,000 NOI divided by the 10 cap market that we talked about. And again, I know that's not um, very common, but I'm just doing this for the sake of math. 
So we take the NOI of 100,000 divided by 0 0.10, and that's a million dollars. Well, if we use some of these other strategies to force the value up, see what we're doing? We're forcing the value up, not by the market, but by the operations. It's called forced appreciation. We, we do a combination of these things. We force the NOI up, and we divide it by the same cap, it's a $2 million uh, about value now, excuse me. So we've, we've made a million bucks here in this scenario. And keep in mind, in some of the markets that are out there, most of them, the cap rates are more like five, right? Or four or six, seven. So if you use a five cap, if you're in a five cap market, you only need to increase the NOI by 50,000 instead of 100,000 to make a million dollars. So it, forcing the, the, the small changes in the net operating income can have huge impacts on the value. So keep that in mind. If it takes an investor, you know, a year to make a million dollars, if it takes you a year to make a million dollars, is it worth it? Probably. If it takes you two years to make a million dollars, is it worth it? Probably. If it takes you all your lifetime to make a million dollars, is it worth it? Probably. Okay, so this is a great strategy, great approach. Let's take a look at how you would how you do the the calculations, the formulas here. Let's say that somebody you, you're an investor and you inquire about a, a property, a, a rental property, a commercial property, and they send you what's called a setup package or a marketing package or an OM. Now we do classes that are called uh, language. Like we do classes that are just on math and we do classes that are just language. And we haven't done that yet, the language. So if you're not familiar with setup package, marketing package, OM, things like that, we have scripts we use for uh, contacting commercial brokers to make sure they cooperate and send you the information and want to work with you um, as an investor or as an agent. It's real important that you understand that stuff. So just jump into some of those classes or again, hopefully uh, we'll come back and we'll do some more of those things for an AR. But let's say they send you this. Now we have the rents. This could be a one page thing that it's all they send you. That's all they have. That's all they know how to do. What do I do with it? Well, you want to figure out what the value should be, right? And so what do we do? We start with the income, like I told you, what I showed you before. And again, it's monthly. So we're going to annualize this number. So 92.75 times 12. If you're at home, take that times 12 of your office, 92.75 times 12. And you're going to get what's called your SGI. And when we do that, it gives us our SGI of 111.3, and that's how we are starting, okay? So then we're gonna take part one of what Michael's class was, and we're going to plug those numbers in everywhere else, and we're gonna complete this column, and when we do that, boom, there's our answers. And this is what the deal looks like right now, presently, 3.5% return, cap rate of 6.87. So how many of you think this is a good deal? Should we buy this? What do you think? Should we buy this? Yes, no. Put it in the chat bar. Steven's looking. And the answer is, what if I say I would like a eight cap? I want an eight cap. I'm looking for only eights or higher. Should I buy this property? Well, I don't know. The answer should be, I don't know. I'm not sure. Is there any upside? Is there any upside? Huge thing to remember. Is there any upside before we make a decision? Because look at what, this, what we just did. So let me go back Look up if you're if you're not following me. Uh, look up real quick. I'm going to go back a couple slides, and I'm showing you here. You can see our rents are 950, 950, 950. We have one vacancy, and we have zero for other income, storage, and parking. And you can see our leases have all expired, right? So what does that mean? It means we can raise rents. And I, a lot of times I'm in rent control areas, and they say, "Well, you can't do that. It's rent control here." Well, it's commercial. Yes, you can. Doesn't mean you should because of COVID and everything that's going on right now or that you can or want to. I understand that. Just in general, though, keep these, keep these strategies in mind because uh, COVID is not always going to be here, hopefully. All right. So you take this. What we're doing here is we're raising these rents, and now you can see what happens. I raise the rents, and now I've got 1800 1800 1800 And look, wow, I found some... Uh, some other income, storage and parking isn't being utilized correctly. So there's 1100. Look at my income now. Now take the monthly income of 14,750 times 12 and tell me what you get. And what you get is 177. So now I'm going to analyze it again using the market numbers, right? The performa. And I'm going to take a look. Remember what I said? I wanted an eight cap. Well, guess what? There's my eight cap right there. And guess what happened to my return on investment? Holy cow. So should I buy this? Well, yeah, 
absolutely, I should buy this. I, I would say yes, with, without knowing most markets even, I would say yes. But really the answer, what's the answer? What is the market in your market showing us? Is the market showing us cap rates that are uh, lower than this? Well, then the answer would be yes, I should buy it. Depend on your goals and objectives. Would the, is your market showing return on investments that are lower than this? Well, then the answer should be, yeah, I should, I should consider buying this, depending on your goals and objectives. If the cap rates in your market are less than, I mean, more or higher, call Michael. But if they are higher, uh, then the answer might be no. And if the return on investments are higher in your market than 19, definitely call Michael. Please call Michael. If you have return on investments higher than 19, please call Michael. Uh, the answer would be yes, buy the property. And what we're doing here is we're taking a look, because what happens is people say, well, Michael, what happens if you raise those rents all that fast? You know, you're gonna lose all those tenants. They're not gonna be able to sustain. Yeah, so you just look at it slowly. Here's a column three where we're just using middle of the road rents. So we're not raising the rents, current rents, column one, market rents, column two. Middle rents, we're raising them gradually slower. And then we go to market rents. And then this last column I've done is seller carry. So see, I'm analyzing this thing using all kinds of different ways and approaches, really looking at this deal. But you guys can all do this. You guys can, you guys can do every single one of these formulas and calculations if you're not familiar with it. You, you just have to practice. You have to get used to it and understand what it means. And then guess what? When we're using spreadsheets, you know, you just zip and through them. It's like zip, 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 zip. It's, it's not a big deal anymore because we're so comfortable with these numbers. All right. So that's it for me, folks. I know I went kind of fast, but I wanted to leave time and respect your time. And I wanted to leave time for questions. Awesome job, Michael. That was such a wonderful presentation and very helpful. Um, I do just want to make a point for all of our members who are listening in. It is not too late to submit a question. Simply just send a message in the chat or send an email to financialwellness at nar.realtor. And again, the recording, the PowerPoint, any additional handouts that come with this presentation will be available on Friday, October 2nd. You're going to visit nar.realtor forward slash cffw forward slash webinars. Now, while Stephen is going to go through a couple of questions that came in, I'll make sure to drop the URL, URL link so that way you can access this recording again. So, Stephen, over to you. Awesome. Thank hey, you. Real quick, Steve, Stephen, real yeah, quick before you jump in, I just want to remind you folks that we're going to put at the end of this question and answer period, we're going to put a, a link to another meeting in here. So if you have questions, we don't have enough time, or you're interested in any of our other courses, that's what we're going to do on this other meeting. We're, we'll, we'll go fast. We won't, wait, we won't take too much of your time on that one. So just want to remind you of that. Awesome. And um, we did have a couple questions. Please send in your questions, you guys, if you have any additional questions. I know uh, Michael went through this kind of quickly. Um, Michael, you mentioned four ways to increase NOI. Well, um, how do you raise rents when some states have rent caps? Well, I assume you're talking about rent control. So if you've got some sort of rent control in your marketplace, well, then you really can't, right? You, you can't, if it's residential apartments, multifamily, you can't, but you should be increasing those rents annually because you can do that three, five, 10%, whatever is the um, you know, max amount in your area. And then right now, as I mentioned a couple of times, you may, um, you may not be able to do it at all because of COVID. Uh, but, you know, again, this is, that's, this is an unusual time, so that's not necessarily going to uh, be applicable forever. Uh, if it's commercial real estate, you can get around rent control. And then um, uh, there was another question to clarify. I've frequent, frequently heard that landlords should always go up on rents. So is that to increase the value? Is that their investing goal? Well, I wouldn't say that's their investing goal, uh, but I agree with you. You should definitely increase those rents, especially in markets where the rent is escalating. And what happens is rents have been so off the charts across the United States for the most part. Rents have just continued to climb, over, especially because the market's been very strong and demand has been very high. 
uh, so during those times, keep up on what is happening for a market. See, what happens is a lot of landlords don't keep up. They just get busy. The cash is flowing. It's going good. They, they don't pay attention. The property managers uh, are not necessarily coming to them all the time saying, hey, you should raise your rents because what does that mean to a property manager? I don't mean to offend any property managers, but what that means to some of them is more work. They got to put out notices and things like that. And so they're not necessarily going to come to the owner or landlord and say, hey, here's what's going on. So as an agent, we approach our investors, landlords, owners using these kind of strategies to help them understand what's going on with the market rent. So keep an eye on your market rents. Keep them up at market rents. Not so much that you start having all this turnover and losing. You know, that's why they don't want to do that necessarily. But they should in general, yeah. Um, another question that just came in. What's your favorite type of um, CRE and why? Of CRE? Favorite yeah, type of commercial real estate. product type, you mean? So yeah. uh, too, too much of, to answer. Um, honestly, I don't mean to dodge that. But that's a big especially right now, you know, so that you've got the big four, uh, big four, multifamily, office, retail, industrial, and then of course, hospitality. Look at what's going on there. Oh my gosh. So within those five sectors, there's opportunities and there's a lot of challenges. I don't have time to really do, we, ha we do a, a class uh, and uh, some of these classes are free, some are not, but uh, we, in, in one of our classes, I don't remember which one it is, come on to the other one after this and we'll, and we'll get you, you know, uh, those class, the class information so you can figure out which one you want to go to. But uh, I, I spend, I don't know, Stephen, what, it's 30 minutes on just this. The, the yeah. short answer, though, is if you, you've got to look at the tenants, think about the tenants of these properties in the, in the, in the, uh, and, and, the and the regulations in your city or state. Uh, so if you look at... Um, uh, office, what's going on with office? Eef. If you look at retail, what's going on in retail? Uh, maybe, a, eh, maybe not, right? Because there's some great tenants out there. There's some strong tenants, some triple net tenants with corporate guarantees. There's some private owners leasing spaces that have personal guarantees. So you, blanket retail, you can't just say blanket. No, for sure. You don't want to do that because retail would be a, a great uh, product type. Uh, multifamily has always been very strong and I've always loved and I still do. It's my favorite for sure. But, you know, there's certain uh, states that are, which, which shall not be mentioned on this webinar, uh, that are having a lot of regulation, massive regulation with rent control and bills right and left and things like that that are causing uh, opportunities and challenges. Uh, and the last one is industrial. I really like industrial. It's always kind of strong, especially now with American medical marijuana and shipping. The right answer though, the, the best answer I think that I like is, you know, don't get involved in something you're not familiar with because managing the asset is so important. And if you're not familiar with managing it, it can be extremely risky. And um, I'm trying to get a clarification on this, um, but Mark had to ask, can you recommend the three best books, please? So I wanted to see exactly where he was going down, but do you have any book recommendations, Michael? Well, I do. I really like uh, I really like two of ours that we've written. Here, here's one that you can't quite see because the background. These are on Amazon. Uh, we've got two of them uh, that we put out. One is kind of like more of a, a workbook. Sorry, that I've got the background here so you can't see it really well. These are on Amazon, The Ultimate Guide to List and Sell Commercial Investment Property. Uh, you can you can look that up and pull us up. I really like those. Um, other than that, um, I, I'm not going to say anything more on it because I can I can feel comfortable promoting myself, uh, my stuff. But I don't know if I should say anything about other stuff. Honestly, I don't know if I should even do that out here um, because it's not my platform. So I I don't you know I don't, I don't think I should do that right now. Um, Plus, I don't really know a lot, but I, uh, in terms of other great books, but there's definitely some. I'm just not sure if it'd be okay for me to, to, to say it. Here to go. And that, oh, wait, I think that's it for questions. Oh, if buying a single family, um, then rent to someone, is the tax for rental income change based on each year, year tax bracket? It's from a, I don't really understand that question. Yeah, that's a, if somebody could come off mute on that one, if you want, and maybe kind of clarify that question, and we can answer that. Yeah, it's coming from 
someone who doesn't want to be um, identified. It's an anonymous question, but it says, if buying a single it's family. Okay. Go on to something else. I, you know, yeah. if you want to be anonymous, I don't, we don't want to. Let's forget it. Um, that's all I have for questions, unless Brittany saw a couple that I might have missed. Um, I did post the link for um, the quick call that we're going to be doing after this. Dana did as well. You can register for that. Um, for security reasons, we're having you register for the class so we can send you the link. We don't want it getting out um, um, and getting uh, <laughs> getting hacked. So um, please register on that link there that is in the chat. Um, Dana, if you could post it one more time, just in case we had some late arrivals, we'll, we'll be doing a, a quick question and answer. Um, but we are here now and we have a couple more minutes. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Other than that, Brittany, I will hand it off back to you. All right, perfect. Well, Michael, thank you so much. We really do appreciate you sharing your wisdom and you know um, all the information that you mentioned today, we will make it available for members. I just wanna say thank you to you for partnering with us and um, diving into about investing. So thank you. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate it, Brittany, and appreciate all your time. And sorry, I feel like it's rushed a little bit, but um, <laughs> again, I wanted to get a, as much as I could in there in the short period of time. No, nope, you did a great job. And so again, members for listening in, you can view the session that uh, Michael has presented part one and now part two on Friday, October 2nd. You're going to visit um, nar.realtor forward slash CFFW forward slash webinars. And so as I'm getting ready to close up, I do just want to make a point that again, you guys also have access to additional resources provided to you through NAR's Right Tools Right Now resource. Um, this is a relaunch program, which includes reduced or no cost tools for you to support you through challenging times. You can visit nar.realtor forward slash RTRN. You can access webinars, educational resources, and timely market reports for your business. Um, and again, thank you so much for your time. This concludes our webinar, and special thanks to our members for joining the call. So if you miss any part of this, you can view the recording PowerPoints handouts on Friday, October 2nd at nar.realtor forward slash CFFW forward slash webinars. And then we have one more note from Stephen, again, about the class. Um, they included the link in the chat. So Stephen, want to hand over one more time to tell members about this next session? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take um, just about 10, 15 minutes to um, go through some of the other training opportunities we have for you and answer some more of your questions about that. If you're viewing either um, the first or the second class, even in the replay, we will have this link up um, for some time in order to schedule more of these calls. But join us right now. We're going to um, be jumping on this, I believe, at 12 uh, 15 um, Pacific Standard Time today to um, answer some of your questions. Michael, myself, and Dana, our whole team will be there. Brittany, I want to thank you so much for helping us set this up and um, do this series for all your members. Um, I, I love these classes, but I also um, love watching people, you know, really reach for their um, their dreams and their futures through this sort of education. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, Brittany, so can, I, can, can I mention yeah. one last thing Real, really quick? I just, you know, I know money is always an issue for investing, right? And so uh, keep in mind that a, a lot of times people will find deals and they'll come across properties that, that may be a good buy, but they don't have the money. So understand that there's investors out there in your marketplace that will partner with you and put the money in and do the deal and you can get going that way. And so keep those things in mind. Don't let lack of money stop you from being an investor because there's too many resources that are out there. That's a perfect closing statement. Thank you so much, Michael. All right, guys, we're gonna send out a survey. When that comes in, please leave us your response on today's presentation. Um, thank you so much, and we look forward to having you join us hopefully next week on Wednesday, October 7th. Take care, and thank you so much, guys. Bye.